are the ideas and the methods of Martin Luther King, Jr. relevant today? I ask this question in the wake of the accolades that have flowed, especially this past week, as people recalled the March on Washington. The accolades are quite different than the voices that were raised about King, especially in the latter years of his life where he came under sharp criticism within the black power struggle, to say nothing of intense opposition from the government. Uh, you would, if you remember the film a couple years ago on the life of J. Edgar Hoover, who particularly was determined to um, silence this voice that seemed to be undermining government of the day. To even speak about King in a Canadian context uh, might seem puzzling. Uh, he makes few references anywhere in his lifetime, uh, even awareness. He refers occasionally to the Underground Railroad, um, but Canada, he, he never visited Canada, never spoke in Canada, and I haven't found a large body of literature indicating anything to suggest that uh, he elicited a great deal of interest on the part of Canadians in his movement. In fact, for many years I was on the board of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, a U.S.-based organization, and also an organization uh, which had associations in Canada and Mexico as well as the United States. And the Canadians in those contexts really dismissed King as of irrelevance. Nonetheless, we have just witnessed this tremendous outpouring of interest with a large march in Washington and speeches again from the same place where he delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech. And I would want to suggest three possible dangers in this metamorphosis of King from a mere mortal with a very powerful speaking voice to a mythic hero. At the time of his death, he led a divided movement. He led part of a divided movement. And in much of the accolades of around King, I see a great deal of trivialization of what he had to say and why it might be important today. He foresaw this. He warned his close associates in 1965 with the passage of the Voting Rights Bill that with the legislative gains that the movement would be eclipsed. Especially, he warned, even before he began speaking against the war in Vietnam, that the movement and struggle for freedom and civil rights and economic rights would be eclipsed by what was happening in Southeast Asia. One other danger, I'm manifesting it, the marketing of King. You can buy t-shirts, you can get Martin Luther King credit cards, you can buy cookie tins. If I brought all the paraphernalia I've collected, it, it, you wonder, what does any of this have to do with what he taught, what he represented? And a third concern is really addresses the question of why is King at all important and why should we pay attention to what he taught and said. There is a huge and growing and widening gap between the rich and the poor in the United States and many of the other issues, not least of which war and freedom are being eclipsed it would do, well, do us well, I want to suggest, on what he taught, what he argued for, and how it might apply to our time. 
So let me make a li little bit of a run in the next 40, 50 minutes and then allow some time for Q&A. And I do have copies of my new book if you really want to delve into it more. It's a collection of essays, two of which are by myself, but from a variety of sources, from Cuba, from Tibet, of people who have been influenced by King and who speak very powerfully to why King matters in, the, in our time and in varying cultures. The key idea I want to focus on tonight is from a speech he gave at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania in June of 1961. He said, and I'm using his language, which means that by today's standards, it's not very inclusive, but I prefer to leave his words untouched. He said that the world has become a single neighborhood. Through our, and I am quoting him, through our scientific genius, we have made the world a neighborhood now through our moral and spiritual development, we must make of it a brotherhood. He was particularly concerned about the color line and how white and black, the white world and the colored world, which was then a growing and ever gro deepening divide, might be fused into a brotherhood something that he called in various forms a single neighborhood, a worldwide fellowship, a beloved community, a phrase that he used on a number of occasions, to eliminate what he called the evil triumvirate of racism, poverty, and militarism, Dr. King believed that humans needed to develop a world or a global perspective. He envisioned a, and I'm quoting him frequently, a new kind of man, a new humanity that would no longer give primary attention to acquisition, to materialism, to power, or to supremacy of one race over another race. He envisioned, rather, that people could come together to eliminate the attitudes and the barriers that humans have contrived to confine people in narrow boxes and nations in different worlds, and thus, by overcoming and eliminating these barriers, move humanity towards what he called the beloved community. Dr. King was very aware that the white and wealthy controlled the world in which he lived. The white and the wealthy continued what he variously called the white western world, controlled this world. The house of the west. The west he equated with yesterdays and slavers and colonial masters. He personally had in mind the United States, Britain, Russia, occasional references to Canada, as I intimated, very few, and Western Europe. But he saw that these countries were essentially white-dominated and had carried supremacist attitudes that undermined developing a global perspective. In response to a question from an interview given in London, England in 1964 on the way to Oslo, where he delivered the Nobel Peace Prize address, Dr. King observed, I think we have to honestly admit that the problems in the world today as they relate to the question of race must be blamed on the white doctrine of white supremacy. The whole doctrine of racism and these doctrines came into being through the white race who have exploited the peoples of the world. Believing the the, and I'm quoting him, the cup of endurance has run over. Dr. King spoke of a deep determination on the part of peoples of color to free themselves from all the shackles of the past. Prophetically, he asserted that if the white world failed to cultivate the spirit of genuine humanity and the qualities needed to overcome racism, then we will end up 
in a far worse race war than the riots that had already engulfed many of the cities of the United States in the 60s. Dr. King pointed to the threat posed by international structures and countries such as South Africa with the practice of apartheid, Portugal's continued colonial supremacy over Angola and Mozambique, the white rule of Ian Smith in southern Rhodesia or Zimbabwe. These were examples of, quote, white men building empires of this, on the sweat and suffering of colored people. Dr. King labeled the Union of South Africa, as it was then called, the classic example of organized and institutionalized white racism. The US and Britain, powerful nations that profess to be the moral, moral bastions of the Western world had actually made apartheid possible. In Oslo, again in 1964, where he was to receive the Nobel Peace Prize, he reiterated a theme that runs through many of his talks from the Montgomery campaign in 58 right into the 60s. He reiterated that racial injustice is a threat to world peace and harmony. It is a threat as great as the atomic bomb. Dr. King believed that the tragic effects of racism required swift remedial action on the part of the white world, which had long profited from the global structures of white supremacy. He also cautioned against antiquated thinking about race and ethnicity that white people tended to have and their use of the vast resources and labor of people of color to their good rather than to, their, to the good of the whites as opposed to people of color. Among the moral imperatives of our time, we are challenged to work around the world with unshakable determination to wipe out all these vestiges of racism. This from a talk on the beloved community. Cautiously optimistic, Dr. King hoped that the United States could lead an international effort to wipe out racism, especially since she presented herself as a model of democracy. He called for practical changes that would enable the country to adhere to its values. He insisted that only by eliminating racism at home would the United States have any authenticity or integrity in leading a world struggle to eliminate racism. He urged that the government of the United States as well as Canada and the European nations to attack racism in their own societies and to apply sanctions against South Africa, Rhodesia, Angola, Southwest Africa, which is now Namibia. In a, in a way, he anticipated a more recent call for reparations that the damage needed to not simply be apologized for. Uh, I think Dr. King would have been a little unsettled by at least a couple of the presidents of the United States going around making triumphant claims in West Africa in particular, but making no attempt to address with any significant foreign aid or other steps to alleviate the poverty. And it's a appalling, for example, that the United States, to my knowledge, has never signed, for example, the International Covenant on the Rights of Children and other international standards. Uh, they may have signed, the presidents may have signed these, but the U.S. Senate has persistently refused to ratify some of these international accords, thus rendering the U.S. quite isolated in, in many of the forums of the world where there is serious attempt for example, the Jubilee campaign to uh, forgive debt and to level the table, as it were, to allow the poorer countries of the world uh, to move forward. Dr. King, though he was in Africa only once and only briefly for the independence celebrations of Ghana 
Uh, at the time he went, it was Gold Coast. When he returned, it was Ghana. Uh, he went as part of the official United States delegation, along with then Vice President uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, there he spoke of the importance of the anti-colonial struggles in Africa. He joined with Eleanor Roosevelt, the widow of the former president, Episcopal Bishop James Pike, and created, helped to create the American Committee on Africa, a United States or New York City-based interracial organization comprised largely of Christian pacifists. Formed initially in 1951, it put forward with uh, King as a major uh, writer of these documents, calls for recognition of Human Rights Day, organized days through the late 50s and into the 60s, days of protest against apartheid, and sought support from around the world for the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. On December 10th, which is often recognized as Human Rights Day. On this, I think it's the day that the UN Charter of Human Rights was, went into effect in 1948. On December 10, 1962, he authored with Albert Mutuli, the South African Nobel Prize, Peace Prize laureate, An Action Against Apartheid, in which Mutuli and King urged uh, all people of goodwill to fight and ultimately tear down racial barriers and to accomplish this, to do so by forming interracial alliances and coalitions. A Christian pastor, Dr. King felt, and I just parenthetically, I, I did distribute a one page that gives a little bit of his life. And basically, he had one career. He started preaching when he was in his teens. And uh, he served through, with all the, the other things going on in his life, he was a pretty regular pulpit presence at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, and then in, uh, in Atlanta, where he was the assistant pastor to his father. As a pastor, King felt that the Christian churches should be at the vanguard of the struggle against racism, as Christianity was a pervasive presence in the white world, especially the white Western world. As he pondered the depth of the world's race problem and the white church's preoccupation with a certain brand of missionary activity, Dr. King concluded that Christianity should be involved in crusades, but not for conversion of the infidel, but against injustice. Convinced that racism in any form scarred and divided the body of Christ, he appealed to the churches of the Western world to transcend doctrinal and cultural differences and to dis work to dismantle racism wherever it existed. He thought in terms of a pan-religious crusade that would bring Muslims, Hindus, Christians, Jews, Buddhists into a common cause to live out of the ethic of love. For he saw the idea of love, a crucial Christian concept, as crucial concept of other religions as well. In 1957, King predicted that the World Council of Churches would hound every Christian layman everywhere with a nagging conscience on the issue of race. Similarly, in 1964, during an interview while he was in the UK en route to receive the Nobel Prize, he noted that Pope, John Paul, uh, Pope Paul VI and the Catholic Church had categorically denounced racism as morally wrong and he asked, why aren't the churches making a similar proclamation of the injustice of apartheid? That at least parts of the Christian churches were speaking out against racism encouraged King. He felt that the world's churches with their vast resources could do more. Moreover, he was very aware of countervailing pressures, especially in South Africa, where the Dutch background Reformed Church 
was among the leading bastions for the most part. There were notable exceptions, such as Bayer's No Day. Um, I'm not sure the king was aware of Bayer's No Day or if Bayer's No Day had surfaced at this point. But there were some significant leaders, white Christian leaders in South Africa who spoke out forcefully against apartheid. And Bayer's No Day went before the World Council of Churches, which then passed a declaration at his urging that apartheid is a sin. With its great minds, its vast resources, King thought that the churches could lead not only practical steps within the churches, but also educational efforts to eliminate racism. He had in mind an education that encourages not doctrinal conformity, but rather a devotion to the search for truth and a refusal to abandon the light of reason. He believed that education could move white people in particular beyond the maze and myths and stereotypes that often their educational backgrounds reinforced. That institutions could be, bring people of different color together and that together they could undertake the purging of false ideas and the fostering of understanding, self-worth, and a ethic of mutual respect. Now, I, I must say that if anybody needs the references to these, either get my book <laughs> or uh, give me an email and I can copy, uh, send you a copy of the transcript, because uh, a lot of these phrases that I'm using are Dr. King's and not my own. Knowing that involvement of the United States and the European na nations in the history of slavery, segregation, colonialism, and neocolonialism, Dr. King condemned, and I quote, the exploitation of colored people of the world. He insisted that the wealthy had a moral obligation to provide capital and technical assistance to the developed nations of the world. And he advocated, and again, I'm quoting his language, a massive, sustained Marshall Plan to conquer the ancient enemy of poverty and po enemies of poverty and race. Now, I'm assuming, I don't assume that everybody knows what the Marshall Plan was. It was an aid program in the Truman administration immediately after World War II. Uh, Truman's Secretary of State was George Marshall. And it was a massive program of assistance, especially to countries like Greece and Turkey, which seemed likely to topple into the communist bloc. In urging such aid, he was aware that the powerful countries might be seen as surreptitiously trying to control the poor countries. Such an approach, he felt, would be wrong he condemned any paternalism or neocolonialism, and but still insisted that the world needed to resolve and to wipe out poverty, ignorance, and disease. Bridging the social and economic gulf between the haves and the have-nots of the world was central to his vision of a global beloved community. King confronted the white world with its responsibility to compensate for the evils of history, past and present. He, he warned against gross neglect of the pover, problems of poverty and illiteracy could lead many of the poor countries to embrace communism or military di dictatorships. Towards the end of his life, King saw life more broadly than in racial terms. I think in the Montgomery bus boycott, he was very much part of a black world with some contacts with the white world, but it was very much, he was very much part of the black movement. But increasingly, as, as the campaigns developed uh, in Georgia and in Alabama, uh, he found himself in increasing alliance with whites. He also, became aware of the impact of the nonviolent struggle in Montgomery 
and other parts of the world. He was invited to Ghana, to Nigeria, to India, to Brazil, to Norway, and in these, in speaking in various contexts, as he would often use the opportunity to focus on the specific problems of the country. He had a staff that would help acquaint him with what was going on in Jamaica. And you can read some of his comments in Jamaica and say, well, how did he ever have a chance to study? Well, he had staff who worked on this and helped prepare his speeches, which has now become controversial in that there's a, some concern about how much of his words are, in fact, his words. They're words that he delivered. I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, a major focus in his last three years of his life was his opposition to the Vietnam War. He did not speak out initially against the war, but in his close circle, uh, after 65, was concerned as they built, the U.S. built up in Vietnam. And finally, on February 25th, in 1967, in Los Angeles, he came out strongly and forcefully against the war in Vietnam, he ex or at least the U.S. part in the war in Vietnam. He expressed dismay that in addition to the deaths of U.S. soldiers, countless Vietnamese peasants were dying. He felt that the war was catastrophic for the principles and values of the United Nation and for President Johnson's agenda uh, for bettering the, econ the economy of the U.S., the war on poverty, and for world peace. For Dr. King, the war not only played havoc with the domestic agenda of the so-called Great Society, but also placed human survival at risk. The use of atomic weapons was a real possibility during the Vietnam War. He decried the production, production of more and more deadly armaments that threatened human survival. He warned, and I'm quoting from uh, this speech in 19. Uh, 67, February 67, the past is prophetic in that it asserts loudly that wars are poor chisels for carving out peaceful tomorrows. One day we must come to see that peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek, but a means by which we arrive at that goal. We must pursue peaceful ends through peaceful means. How much longer must we play at deadly war games before we heed the plaintive pleas of the unnum unnumbered dead and maimed of past wars. He pleaded a month later in New York City in a address that has been widely reprinted uh, and in many languages. Um, he called for the end of this madness. We must stop this war now. I speak as a child of God and brother to the suffering poor of Vietnam. I speak for those whose land is being laid waste, whose homes are being destroyed, whose cultures are being subverted. I speak for the poor of America. I speak for, as an American to the leaders of my nation. The great initiative in this war has been ours. The initiative to stop it must be ours. He called for the following steps to end this nightmarish conflict. End all bombing in North and South Vietnam. Declare a unilateral ceasefire. Take immediate steps to curtail military buildup. Preclude, include all parties in meaningful negotiations. Set a date by which all foreign troops are withdrawn from Vietnam in accord with the 1954 Geneva Accords. He called for active resistance. We must be prepared to march, to match actions with words by seeking our every creative means of protest. Among forms of protest, King counseled young men and women concerning the draft. He noted many ways, meant that many were taking the path of alternative service and conscientious objection, including more than 70 students at his own alma mater, Morehouse College. He encouraged all seminarians and ministers of draft age to give up their exemptions and seek service as, as conscientious objectors. 
Now, parenthetically, this is the one point where King spoke to me directly. I read a report of this. I mentioned earlier that I was in seminary in Rochester, New York, and I went immediately to the president and said, I, I'm going to give up my automatic uh, exemption and go before my draft board. But I d was surprised by Dr. Bartlett's response was a, a encouragement. And I learned only later, doing project for a, an entirely different book that, on the b history of the Baptist Peace Fellowship, that he himself had been a conscientious objector in World War II. Mm -hmm. At any case, that's how I ended up serving, uh, went through the US government for three years as doing uh, stuff like built, putting in wells and villages in Cameroon. For Dr. King, the Vietnam War uh, was cruel and senseless. He cited William Fulbright's phrase, an arrogance of power. He thought the U.S. had become the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. He felt the war was bringing us close to World War III. He lamented that too many governments and heads of state speak of Gandhi but do not follow Gandhi literally and apply his spirit to international problems. It has been my belief that nonviolence is the only solution to the social problems of the world. More than ever, he commented, the Gandhian method of nonviolent direct action must be applied in international affairs. King felt that within international forums, such as the UN, the US could take a role in fostering a revolution of values that would make the pursuit of peace possible and take precedence over the culture of war that had come to dominate the United States. He saw the UN as an important forum for guiding diplomacy and economic action in the promotion of peace and security. We must speak out in a multitude of voices. The thunder of our voices will be the only sound stronger than the blasts of the bombs and the clamor of war historia. He called upon the United Nations to intervene non-militarily in the Vietnam conflict. The alternative to strengthening the UN and disarming the whole world may be civilization plunging into the abyss of annihilation. He called for a peace race to replace the arms race. He urged synagogues and churches to take the lead in making this a reality. He urged them to become a major positive force in eradicating war and establishing a culture of peace. He encouraged the white churches to reclaim Jesus' image as the Prince of Peace and to reclaim the sacrificial spirit of the early Christians and to make relevant in his time their prophetic witness against war. He called for a deeper and more consistent moral commitment to overcome the evils of war on the part of whoever committed war. He saw peace not only as a goal we seek, but as a means by which we reach that goal. Now, in the last few minutes before I open the floor for uh, questions, I want to just speak especially of the bonds that King began to forge with people of, of African descent. As I mentioned, he was part of the official delegation in 1957 to recognize the independence of Ghana. Accompanying him was President, Vice President Richard Nixon and the African American Nobel Peace Prize laureate we often forget that King was not the first African American to receive the Nobel Peace Prize, but Ralph Bunch, who received the 1950 prize for his mediation in the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict that led to the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. Two black congressmen were also part of the delegation, Charles Diggs and Adam Clayton Paul Jr. As well, also his wife accompanied them. In Ghana, King saw the birth of an independent nation. Now, go, there were a couple of countries that had not come under, officially under colonial rule, but go, they, 
The transition from colony to independence of Gold Coast was a remarkable event in the 1950s. An independent, as he put it, an independent Negro nation demonstrates that the elementary rights of citizenship and equality, it could be a model for people of color everywhere. Ghana's independence was the start of a worldwide move towards independence. And it's important to remember in the 50s, much of the world was still under colonial rule of Angola, Britain, France, and Portugal. He equated the squalor he saw with the squalor of people of color in parts of the world that he visited, including India on another occasion, and Nigeria, which he also visited. When he undertook such international travel, he was inspired that the colonial world was coming to an end. He urged that people support people of color through whatever means possible. And I want to play just part of a tape. Uh, I'll, I'll finish my talk and then I'll come back and play just so you hear some of King's words, how he spoke to his own congregation about what the birth of a new nation might mean. Um, not sure of the flow. I, I think I'd rather end with King rather than with me. So I'll, I'll come back to, just for a few minutes, uh, just listen to King extolling the birth of a new nation. In India, he felt very much that he was walking in the footsteps of Gandhi, although Gandhi by now was long dead. Upon it, returning from India, he wrote, I left India more convinced than ever that nonviolent resistance is the most potent weapon available to oppressed people. In an interview in India, it published in the Hindustan Times, he explained that the Gandhian influence in some way will speak to the conscience of the world as nations grapple with international problems. If we fail to follow the Gandhian principle of nonviolence, we may all end up destroying ourselves through the misuse of our own instruments. The choice is no longer between violence and nonviolence. It is between nonviolence and non-existence. In a sermon preached in 1959, he explored what Gandhi had done in India and why people should follow the pra practices. He led because of his absolute sincerity and absolute dedication. Here was a man who achieved in his life li in lifetime the bridging of the gulf between ego and id. Gandhi had the amazing capacity for self-criticism. This was true in individual life and in family life. This was true in his people's life. He criticized himself whenever he needed. When he made a mistake, he professed it publicly. Here is a man who would say to the people, I'm not perfect, I'm not fallible, I am fallible. I don't want you to start a religion around me. I'm not a god. I'm convinced today that there would be a religion around Gandhi if Gandhi had not insisted all his life, I don't want a religion around me. I'm a human, I'm fallible. In an article published in the Christian Century, King highlighted the role of nonviolence to free India and cited five points that he had learned in India that he felt relevant to other struggles, including in the US. First, it's not for cowards. It's a method of resistance. You will meet resistance. Second, the resistor does not seek to defeat or humiliate an opponent but to win his friendship and understanding. Third, the methods attack forces of evil. Nonviolence, resistance, attack forces of evil rather than persons who are caught up in those forces. It is evil we are seeking to defeat, not persons, even the Jim Clarks and George Wallaces. It's not the people who have themselves been victimized by evil. At the center of nonviolent resistance stands the principle of love. Along the way of life, somehow we must have a sense, we must have sense enough and morality enough to cut off the chain of hate, 
This can only be done by projecting the ethic of love at the center of our life. And finally, nonviolent resistance is based on the conviction that the universe is on the side of justice. It is this deep faith in the future that causes the nonviolent resistor to accept suffering without retaliation. So in Montgomery, we can walk and never grow weary. We know there will be a great camp meeting in the promised land of freedom and justice. He formed, as I spoke earlier, uh, uh, associations that were dedicated to the uh, uprooting of apartheid. He raised funds for these organizations. He traveled widely, sometimes speaking in three different cities in a day, just before some of the jet planes that we now have, meeting with colleges, uh, with students, with whoever would be interested in talking about the need to overcome apartheid. This is the struggle of our day. More than any other struggle that engaged this attention it was the overcoming of apartheid. The only possible exception, there are a lot of references in his speeches and in his writing to the situation of poverty in Haiti. He concluded that people of color in the United States needed to join those through the Caribbean and Latin America and Africa and in fact around the world in addressing the universal problem of racism and to lead a movement to bring colored people together to eradicate poverty, racism, and war. Speaking on one occasion in Jamaica, he alluded to the magnificent drama of independence taking place around the world as countries were becoming independent. He spoke of the interrelated structure of reality and the need to eradicate all that made colonialism possible and prevented the creation of a culture of peace. From July 24th to July, uh, June 24th to July 3rd, 1960, King attended a world gathering of Baptists in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. This experience further enhanced his conviction that the struggle to eliminate slavery and colonialism was still a struggle to be had. Writing in, where do we go from here? Shortly after this visit, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? He lifted up the need for the US to end military adventures around the world. He created the image of erecting a world house that would be built on the foundation of worldwide freedom, a humanized technology, the elimination of poverty, the, and finding alternatives to war. In October 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis escalated tensions between the US and former Soviet Union and Cuba. Though the two superpowers avoided catastrophe, King was concerned about the possible lingering possibility of a nuclear conflict. He felt that the elimination of nuclear wars was the moral imperative of the day. Every one of us knows how well, full well, that we came dreadfully close to the precipice of nuclear war in 1962. There is a grave danger, however, that our quote unquote success in handling the crisis could be misread. We cannot allow the passing of this controversy to enable us to continue a policy of building up nuclear armaments. This would be arrogant. King urged that the US turn its attention to disarmament and to improve the health and education programs of the world with the funds released from producing arms. Brief reference to the Arab-Israeli conflict. It was a deep concern for him. He wanted to go to uh, Israel, but never had an opportunity. He was concerned, uh, especially for the survival of the Palestinian people. He was convinced that the Arab world is in a state of imposed poverty and backwardness that threatens peace and harmony. He called for the UN to take action that would lead to Arab, the development of the Arab world and a lasting peace in the Middle East. He called for recognition of 
China, this was in a period before the US had relations. I think Canada preceded China, uh, the United States by at least a decade and its admission to the United Nations. He could not envision a more a peaceful world that excluded the population, so, so significant a population. Moreover, working with China was necessary to resolve the conflict in Southeast Asia. I could go on with a sort of shopping list of areas around the world. Suffice it to say that I have tried to address the question with which I open. Are King, what were King's ideas and are they relevant for today? Civil conflicts persist. Expenditures on human development have decreased. Nuclear weapons are a reality. Civil conflicts persist. We've been, for the last few days, teeter-tottering on the brink of war in Syria which could involve ultimately nuclearization. Israel and Palestine have yet to resolve long-standing conflicts. I want to suggest that these situations require attention to the building of a culture of peace. I've pulled out of my pocket, and I'd like to close with this, and then we can listen to King and respond to questions. I went to the King Center in Atlanta. I started working on King research in the 80s. And I happened to be in Atlanta at the time of the first King holiday in the United States. Uh, it was starting to fall apart, so I finally lam had it laminated. But this has been my commitment since 1968. In honor of Martin Luther King Jr.'s life work, I pledge to do everything that I can to make America and the world a place where equality and justice, freedom and peace will grow and flourish. On January 20th, 1986, I commit myself to loving, not hating, increasing understanding and not showing anger, making peace and not war. Those pledges of 25 years ago strike me as worthy to continue, and I invite you to join me in a world effort to create a culture of peace, first in our own societies, and then worldwide. Thank you.